Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. This is a lesson on alcohol, its effects and dangers. So the alcohol that people drink when they're enjoying alcoholic beverages is actually called ethanol or ethyl alcohol. Um, so ethanol is what's in beer, wine, hard alcohol, etc. And it's made from alcohol fermentation with yeast. Uh, if you look at how breweries make their beer, how um, wineries um, make their wine, it's, it's yeast. Um, and there are lots of different types of yeast. Um, sometimes they're, they're actively adding, actually usually they're actively adding uh, yeast uh, to make it happen. Um, but there are even like beers out there that just use um, just natural fungi that happen to just be there um, with whatever plant product they're trying to ferment. Uh, but typically, yeah, it's, it's adding active yeast, and the yeast do alcohol fermentation rather than lactic acid fermentation like we do. And really, um, alcohol is kind of like the waste product of yeast as they're um, metabolizing sugars. And so a multitude of plant parts can be used to make it um, ethanol, as long as sugar is present. So wine is not just made out of grapes. You can make wine out of plums. Uh, you can make wine out of apples. Uh, you could do it. Um, so as long as uh, the plant part has a significant amount of sugar to supply the yeast with glucose so it can then spit out the alcohol. Um, the reason why grapes are so common with making wine is grapes have a, a really high amount of sugar in them compared to some other fruits. Uh, human liver. The human liver is really what is affected um, the most by alcohol. It can break down ethyl alcohol or ethanol at a particular pace. Um, everyone's pace is ever so slightly different. Um, so you can look up averages in terms of like how much alcohol can a liver break down per hour. Um, but different people will have slightly different paces. Um, so if you're wondering why did so-and-so um, get a DUI when they only drank such and such amount of beer, um, it's hard to predict how fast your liver breaks it down. But I'm digressing. This is ethanol. This is a representation of the molecule of ethanol. So it has two carbons. It's got the OH off to the side here. That's part of the reason it's called an, an alcohol. Um, this is what's broken down in the liver. Um, this is actually, it's toxic. It is a poison. And that sounds odd to say, but that's why we have the term alcohol poisoning. It's just a matter of how much of this is in your bloodstream. Uh, similar with arsenic or cyanide, those are poisons, uh, but you can find traces of arsenic, just tiny, tiny amounts in the human body. What makes arsenic poisonous is if you're exposed to enough of it. Same thing with alcohol. Alcohol, um, little bits at a time, not that big of a deal, but um, lots of overexposure um, can definitely kill a person. Other alcohols are out there. This, ethanol is just one kind of alcohol. Uh, propanol. Uh, you may have heard of isopropyl alcohol. Rubbing alcohol. It will be this. Um, it's not recommended you drink that. Um, it's something that we use to, you know, help with uh, getting rid of bacteria, you know, cleaning a wound site. Um, methanol uh, is actually, it is poisonous. Uh, if you were to drink methanol, um, it could actually result in liver failure. So how is ethanol metabolized? How is it broken down in the liver? Well, alcohol dehydrogenase is the main player. So this is the enzyme that starts to break apart ethanol. So initially, alcohol dehydrogenase in the liver converts ethanol into acetaldehyde. And you're going to hear more about acetaldehyde later on in this lesson related to hangovers. Acetaldehyde is converted to acetate by other enzymes. And eventually it's broken down into CO2 and water. Um, so acetaldehyde is not that final product. There are other enzymes that break it down even further. So this acetate long-term becomes CO2 and water. And of course you <sighs> exhale CO2 and water can hang around. Eventually you're gonna urinate it out though. Other factors affecting the pace. So it's not just how much alcohol dehydrogenase you have. There are other things that can affect it. Um, sex and sex hormones. Studies have shown time and time again that if you took a thousand random men and a thousand random women and had them all drink the same amount of alcohol over the same amount of time, and then you took their BAC, their, their blood alcohol concentration, you're going to hear more about this in a bit. On average, 
um, for that amount of alcohol over that period of time, men would have a slightly lower BAC than women. And we're talking a separation of, of 0.01 uh, BAC. Um, so for that amount of alcohol, maybe uh, the average man has 0.06, but the average female has 0.07. Um, so that most likely is related to slightly different amounts of alcohol dehydrogenase in the liver. Um, it's not true for every man and every woman. It's a, a statistical kind of average. Um, so the specific amount of sex hormones in your, in your body probably have something to do with it. Body mass. Uh, if me and someone who has twice the mass as me, weighs twice as much as me, sat down and drank the same amount of alcohol over the same amount of time, um, I'm going to have a higher BAC. My liver is smaller. I have probably less blood in my body than that person. Uh, so that, of course, has an impact too. Someone who is significantly larger is going to probably have a lower blood alcohol concentration. And medications can get in the way of the liver effectively breaking it down at the pace that it normally does. So types of alcoholic beverages, um, this is not all of them, but these are the three, the big ones. Um, hard alcohol, a lot of the time when you're looking at vodka, rum, tequila, et cetera, you're going to see that it's 40% ethanol by volume. And proof, when you see that something is 80 proof, they take the percentage of alcohol and multiply it by two. Um, so a lot of hard alcohols are 80 proof. Yeah, some of them will be 90 proof, uh, 150 proof or more. You're not going to see alcohol for sale that is 200 proof, uh, pure ethanol. Um, pure ethanol is not very stable. Uh, and also drinking that would be crazy. Um, that's, that's way too concentrated. So the majority of them are closer to 80 proof. Wine on average is about 12 to 15% ethanol. Uh, and beer, most beers are going to be close to five, but you know, some are four point whatever, uh, beers can get up to eight, even 10%, uh, ethanol by volume. And the rest is everything else. Uh, um, the water uh, that's in it, um, the other products of, of fermentation, um, the uh, hops and barley and all those other things that affect uh, the beer and its flavor. Um, okay, one more thing. Hard alcohol, one drink of hard alcohol is supposed to be an ounce and a half, um, you know, a shot glass. One drink of wine is supposed to be about five ounces, not a full, you know, if you take a wine glass and pour it up to the rim, that's a lot more than a typical glass of wine. And beer, uh, typically 12 ounces, that's in a can. Um, so the misconception a lot of people have is they'll go to a bar or a restaurant and order something like this, a Long Island iced tea. And this is a goblet full. I don't know how many ounces that is exactly, but... Uh, I'm guessing it's somewhere between 5 and 12. Uh, maybe it's 10. Uh, so this 10-ounce glass, a long and iced tea, has four kinds of hard alcohol in it. Um, and I'm guessing they're not pouring a, a quarter shot of each. So people will have one drink, you know, one mixed drink. And, and that's actually more like three or four drinks that you just had. So somebody, you know, will go to a bar, have a long, long island iced tea, and then think they're good to drive. They're not. Um, even if they weigh 250 pounds, they probably would have a higher BAC than what's legal. Um, so the amount of beverages you're consuming um, is not always correlated with this. Um, the amount of hard alcohol that's in it or the size of the glass of wine you're poured can have an impact on how high your BAC is going to be uh, and also depending on how fast you drink it. All right, alcohol's immediate effects. Um, alcohol is a depressant. Um, you know, initially it, when you first start drinking, you know, psychologically you might be excited if you're out with your friends and yeah, your heart rate might be higher. Your blood pressure might be a little higher, especially if you're telling an animated story, but alcohol, the effects of it, as you put it in the body has a depressing effect. Um, too much alcohol in the body is going to significantly lower your heart rate, significantly lower your blood pressure and depress the ability of your nervous system, your higher brain, and your brain functions in general. BAC, like I mentioned before, is blood alcohol concentration. In the United States, 0 0.08 is the legal limit for driving. Um, you could be given a DUI at 0 0.08, uh, but you know sometimes they'll let it slide. But of course, 0 0.09 and higher, you're definitely getting a DUI. Um, 
it's it's dangerous to be behind the wheel when, when you're at that level. Even if psychologically you think, oh yeah, I'm good. Um, you're not even aware of how much you are impaired at that point. Um, your ability to focus um, and multitask and to coordinate your body activities when you're behind a potentially deadly machine is, is not quite uh, up to par. Um, and actually, back in the day, it used to not be um, 0.08 um, in every state, but, uh, but now it is. So how do they figure out a BAC? Well, 100 milligrams per deciliter of alcohol in terms of its you know, weight inside of this volume in terms of your body fluids equals that, that percentage that tells you BAC. Um, so 0.1, that's actually high. That, see, that's higher than this. This is 0.08%. Um, 0.1%, that's higher than the legal limit. So let's, let's go back to uh, 0 0.05. So 50 milligrams is about a BAC of 0 0.05. So you could technically drive. It's buzz driving, which is not recommended. But what happens at that point for most people, you know, they've had a drink or two, loss of inhibition. You're more likely to do certain things that you wouldn't have done when you're sober. Uh, a warm feeling inside. Flushed skin. Some people will get a little bit of redness. Uh, mild impairment of judgment. And by the way, the flushed skin, the redness is because of vasodilation, um, the lowering of blood pressure in, in the capillaries of the skin. And mild impairment of judgment. In terms of your decision making, slightly impaired. Um, now let's flash forward to point one. Slurred speech. This is the point where you're past the ability to, to drive effectively. Um, slurred speech, you know, kind of just, you know, like this. Confusion. Uh, you know, maybe the mental processes aren't quite working as well. Emotional instability. They're going to be potentially reacting to things way more emotionally than they typically would. And, you know, inappropriate giddiness about certain things. Point two, we're getting significantly more impaired here staggering, falling over, maintaining balance at this point, um, those, those um, more you know, reptilian parts of the brain, the parts of the brain inside of the cerebrum that regulate just your ability to coordinate your body activities are going to be affected. Double vision, um, not being able to see just one image, uh, and memory loss. Um, at this point, people will get blackout drunk, that term meaning um, when they wake up the next day, they don't even remember uh, what happened when they were at this point. Um, this is getting to the point of alcohol poisoning. Um, some people at this point would get alcohol poisoning, meaning um, they would just be unconscious all of a sudden, uh, have labored breathing, and uh, potentially um, die from, from it. it. It depends on the person, of course, but what I didn't include in here is a point three. Point three for the average person is definitely alcohol poisoning. Um, point three is very dangerous. Uh, that person should be going to a hospital. Um, their, their brain is severely impaired uh, by the alcohol flowing in their bloodstream. And since the brain is regulating the activities of organs, um, their entire body is being negatively impacted. 400 milligrams per deciliter. Point four is typically going to be death. Um, for some people it might take to 0.5 to kill them, but um, 0.4 will make you uh, comatose, go into a coma, incontinence, urinating and defecating um, without control, irregular breathing, labored breathing, and extremely low blood pressure um, in terms of getting um, fluids around the body effectively. So alcohol's effect on organs. I'm not going to read all of this, but um, you can pause and, and check it out. Um, how alcohol affects your body. You can see that it's not just the liver. It's, it's a lot of uh, different organs, and this isn't even all of them. Uh, the brain, I kind of went over this uh, with the last slide in terms of how the brain affects someone's behavior. Um, drinking alcohol could cause your blood pressure to rise over time. You know, alcohol abuse over time, even though it's a depressant, can lead to high blood pressure. Um, and yeah, it can increase the size of your heart, which makes it less efficient. The stomach, um, you're putting empty calories in your body, can cause weight gain. Uh, of course, vomiting uh, is something that can happen with too much alcohol. And ulcers and cancer. The liver, um, long-term effects are cirrhosis of the liver. I'll, I'll show you a, an image of that um, later on. The reproductive system, um, it's going to cause some negative impacts on that. And of course, um, loss of inhibition, uh, the likelihood of someone having unprotected, unsafe sex, 
uh, and making poor decisions with that are going to be increased uh, the more intoxicated they get. So misconceptions on alcohol intoxication. You cannot, I promise you, you cannot speed up the liver's breakdown of alcohol with coffee, food, cold showers, etc. They don't work. If you've heard this to be true, okay, it's possible that coffee can make the person feel more awake, but it's going to do nothing to get the alcohol out of their system. Same with eating something. So someone who's really drunk and needs to go home, they need to eventually drive, they'll say, oh, feed him something, feed her something, she'll, she'll feel better and they'll be fine. Only time is going to have an impact on how fast the liver breaks down ethanol out of the bloodstream and gets it into acetaldehyde, acetate, etc. Um, cold shower may once again make someone feel uh, a little bit more alert or awake, but it will not speed up the breakdown of alcohol. Only time will do that. Um, now, one thing I wanted to mention about food is um, they, they say, people say that, um, you know, drinking on empty stomach is significantly different. I, I know what they mean by that, because if you, let's say, uh, have, a, have a big meal and, um, you know, have a few glasses of wine, uh, the speed at which that alcohol will get absorbed into your stomach uh, relative to the amount of food in there is a little bit different than if you drink on an empty stomach. If you drink on an empty stomach, it does hit you quicker, um, especially if you haven't eaten in a while. Um, but in general, these do not have an impact on the speed at which ethanol is broken down in your liver. Um, there's a difference between going to bed intoxicated and passing out from potential alcohol poisoning. What I mean by that is um, somebody who's had a dangerous amount of alcohol, who's been maybe taking shots all night, um, chugging beers, if they just randomly pass out on the couch as they've been drinking, um, we're talking about potential danger of alcohol poisoning. And someone like that who's passed out on their back not only is their heart rate probably going to be lower than it should and their blood pressure is going to be lower, but if they vomit in that position while they're on their back, they could get what's called aspiration pneumonia. If you aspirate on your vomit, it, it simply means that they, they vomited, their, their stomach expelled what was in there and it's because of too much alcohol and they could choke. The, al the, uh, sorry, the vomit could end up going down into their trachea uh, and into their lungs and they could suffocate. Uh, and this, this happens. Um, so watch out for your friends if this is a situation where they, they passed out. Uh, put them on their side um, so that if they vomit, it's less likely to be choked on. Um, but when they get to the point where they're, they're passing out and, and they look pale, they look flushed, they look sweaty, they look ill, uh, get them to a hospital. Better to be safe than sorry. And binge drinking, which happens much more in this country, in, in the United States, than um, people are aware of, and worldwide too. Uh, binge drinking is consuming four to five drinks or more in two hours. Now, the average person would say, well, that's just partying, man. Well, that's the definition of binge drinking. Binge drinking is pretty much drinking to get drunk. Um, that's binge drinking. And, and that kind of activity over time is, is really harmful to your liver. It's harmful to the other organs of the body. And... Um, you know, over time, um, lots of binge drinking, it has long-term effects. Um, so yes, the average person, you know, 90 something percent of adults have participated in binge drinking at some point. Um, doing it more often becomes a dangerous habit. Hangovers, how do they happen? Numerous factors, and I'm not listing all of them, but I'm listing the main ones. Numerous factors impact the severity of a hangover. Uh, so alcohol tolerance, Somebody who drinks alcohol a lot can get to the point where they don't experience a hangover as significantly as someone who uh, just drank for the first time and woke up with, with a significant headache. Um, so alcohol tolerance over time can have something to do with it. Acetaldehyde. So remember, acetaldehyde is that first um, kind of intermediate product of the breakdown of ethanol in the liver acetaldehyde in the bloodstream before it gets broken down further has a nauseating effect. So the more of that that's in the bloodstream, the more you feel, Ugh. and that's why somebody the next morning um, will, if they're severely hungover, will have that need to, to vomit or feel like they need to vomit. Uh, so acetaldehyde in the bloodstream has that effect. Massive dehydration. Um, I mentioned this in one of the previous lessons uh, regarding ADH. ADH is the antidiuretic hormone 
uh, coming from the pituitary gland, and this tells your kidneys to hang on to water. Well, ethanol in the bloodstream prevents this from working. It, it doesn't get to the kidneys and work properly. So that causes somebody who's been drinking a bunch to urinate excessively. And somebody who's been drinking a lot, if their urine starts looking clear, that's dangerous. They are urinating such a high percentage of water that they're severely dehydrating their body. And so the next morning, uh, that, that massive amount of dehydration, of course it's going to cause a headache. Uh, because not only is your body in general dehydrated, your brain uh, is working on less water than it's used to. And that gets in the way of um, just regular cellular activity. So massive dehydration is also another part of it. Some people complain that um, red wine or um, dark whiskey or things like that cause them to get a hangover more so than other alcohols. That has to do with congeners. Congeners are chemicals that are found um, much more in darker uh, liquors or darker alcohols like red wine and, and bourbon and things like that. Uh, so some people claim like, oh, I can drink vodka or white wine and, and not get that hangover. And they did a study to verify this. Um, you know, they got hundreds of people together and the control group um, had alcohols with very low amounts of congeners and the experimental group had uh, a lot of congeners in it. And on average, the uh, high congener group experienced much more um, of a hangover uh, the next morning than the control group. Uh, but it depends on the person. And uh, ethanol still in the bloodstream can be something else. Somebody who has um, consumed so much alcohol the night before, they when they wake up, they can actually still be slightly drunk, which means the really massive hangover effects can be felt later on in the day when a lot of that still is be converted to acetaldehyde. And, um, you know, if you've heard the, the term hair of the dog, some people to deal with a hangover the next morning will drink again to relieve, ironically, to relieve the effects of a hangover. But you're just delaying the inevitable. The, the alcohol you drink the next morning may make you feel better for a little while, uh, but you're just adding fuel to the fire in terms of um, the hangover uh, that you're going to experience later on. Um, so the, the cures for hangover, it, it depends on who you ask. There's a lot of different theories about how to cure a hangover. Um, get some rest, drink lots of fluids, and, and eat a decent meal. Alarming statistics. Alcoholism affects more than 10 million people in the U.S. alone. Uh, that's alarming. Uh, the U.S. has a little over 300 million people. That's a lot of people uh, in terms of the percentage. Alcoholism is probably, um, it's hard to say exactly, but it's probably society's most expensive health problem. If you consider the amount of alcohol um, that is consumed yearly by all kinds of people, all kinds of adults, uh, the estimates is 136 billion annually. That's healthcare costs, that's um, damage from, from driving drunk, um, that's you know spousal abuse, there's all kinds of uh, effects uh, in terms of cost um, um, because of alcoholism. Um, alcohol affects um, or has effects on all, oops, this is a typo, on all physiological uh, tissues. <laughs> I didn't mean symptoms here. All physiological tissues. Um, and I pointed this out um, previously with um, uh, the dangers of alcohol, the previous slides, and, and that image that had all those different organs. Um, so it's not just the liver. I mean, the liver, you see a lot of uh, long-term effects there, but it affects the brain. It does affect your brain chemistry over time. And that's part of um, the addiction that happens um, with alcoholism. Women consuming one ounce of alcohol per day during pregnancy have a high rate of spontaneous abortion, of, of losing the baby. Um, and even if they don't lose the baby, they're more likely to have what's called fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS. Uh, the baby's going to be underweight. It's going to have um, mental difficulty um, that's permanent. Um, and it's going to have other physiological problems uh, because of that alcohol consumption. And remember, the baby and the mother are sharing a blood supply, and the alcohol is going to have an effect on their development. Genetic factors do play a role in someone's risk for alcoholism. Um, if one or more of your parents are alcoholics, uh, the likelihood of you becoming an alcoholic is higher. Chromosome 11 can sometimes play a role. So research has shown that 
when you study the chromosomes and, and genotypes of alcohol, uh, alcoholics, um, there's, there's a lot pointing to chromosome 11. Uh, it's not a guarantee, but um, there are um, some pointers to that chromosome playing a role. Health problems related to alcohol. I already discussed some of them, but um, alcohol abuse is uh, a broad term. Um, you know, uh, binge drinking over time is, is a form of alcohol abuse. So it's really um, how abusive is the person being? Um, how many nights a week are they drinking? How much are they drinking over how many years? And that alcohol abuse can add up. Um, alcohol poisoning, um, that is deadly. Um, alcohol poisoning leads to the person losing consciousness um, and, and, and having massive um, uh, problems in terms of their brain function, in terms of their heart and blood vessels supplying uh, nutrients and oxygen to their tissues. And when I was an EMT, I, I witnessed this firsthand. Um, an EMT is similar to a paramedic. Uh, when I was in college, I witnessed uh, an individual who had alcohol poisoning. Um, she was unconscious and vomiting while unconscious. Uh, we had to use what's called a VVAC on her, a vomit vacuum to clear her airway so that she wouldn't aspirate on her own vomit. Uh, that's scary. And, and that night started out as a fun time with her and her friends, and it was just way too many shots uh, of alcohol in, in a very short period of time. And she's lucky that she lived. Alcoholism, um, of course, is the, the long-term addiction to alcohol uh, that affects millions of Americans and, and many, many millions of people worldwide. Um, people say they're an alcoholic um, their whole life because um, there's always a risk that if they take a drink, even after 20, 30 years of being sober, they can go right back to uh, abusing alcohol and, and abusing their body. Um, so uh, groups like Alcoholics Anonymous can help with that. Fatty liver uh, can eventually lead to cirrhosis. So a fatty liver, I mentioned this before uh, with previous lessons on the, on the liver, that over time, alcohol abuse, drinking too much alcohol can make the liver grow in size because of fatty deposits. The liver will actually get, over time, less deep dark red like you're used to seeing in a healthy liver and start to look white in appearance because of these fat deposits. And long-term cirrhosis, uh, this is not even the worst picture I've seen of a, of a liver with cirrhosis, but this is uh, permanent liver damage. The only cure to cirrhosis is a liver transplant, and if untreated in terms of the, the, the transplant, uh, cirrhosis leads to death. Um, so this is a severe uh, liver disease, and alcohol abuse over time or drug abuse uh, can lead to cirrhosis. So you can tell just by looking at it, that's not a healthy looking liver. Uh, so be wise when it comes to um, using alcohol as an adult. Thanks for watching Educator.com.